Hello, hello, and thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, we have a great program for you today. Uh, my name is David Hill. I'm the assistant director of the Fitchburg Senior Center. And uh, these are the kind of programs I love to put on. I love to have good turnouts for these. And so uh, I think we've succeeded in that department. We have Dr. Zorba today. And as most of you already know, he's a regular with Channel 3 News. He is also with Wisconsin Public Radio. His last show with Tom Clark was this last weekend. And so uh, we're sort of sad to see Tom go. I always enjoyed the banter back and forth between the two, but it was time for Tom to uh, move on, and uh, Zorba will tell you more about that, but uh, what a great show that is. And he also writes a column for the Wisconsin State Journal, so he stays busy. I believe you're, you've been retired for a year? From I'm your... retired from my full-time practice. Right. I have a hobby practice now. Yeah, of work, course. work a few days a month. Okay. Correct. All right. Well, we're delighted to have Dr. Zorba with us today, and let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Before I start, I want to talk to you a little bit about something I think that's important that uh, is really the, one of the reasons that I speak, and there's something called health literacy. Now, health literacy is the ability to get information that you can understand and make a decision. Some of it is simple. Take one tablet twice a day. I can never I forget, years ago I had a, a young woman, urinary tract infection, kept on getting it over and over and over again. And I finally said, well, tell me what your day is like. And she told me, I get up in the morning and I take, she was on Bactrim, which is a twice a day sulfa pill. I get up in the morning and I take my Bactrim pill. Uh, and then what do you do? And then she said, well, then I take my other pill because it says take one tablet twice a day and I don't want to forget. So she had been taking all of her medications at the same time. Now you might think, my God, was that person really dumb or stupid or that? And the answer was no, it's because we did not communicate it correctly. It's really not the problem with that person. So I mention that because there's a lot of stuff, but health literacy has expanded to something else. It's really expanded to, have any of you heard of the internet? The internet, so it used to be you would get things from what you thought was pretty reasonable, a newspaper, Time Magazine, Newsweek, US News and World Report, Life Magazine, those things really a bit the dust, and then you would trust that information. And now what happens, you go to the internet on a screen, and if the screen looks good, we can all be taken away and think that the information is good. And as you know, there's so much information. We won't talk about senior scamming information because everyone knows of somebody who's been scammed on the phone or been scammed on the internet. But you're also scammed with health information. So you've got to be very, very careful about health information. For instance, there's some people who believe that COVID never really existed, that it really was fake, and it was only a reason there was a deep state coming in to actually produce and grab our money and stuff. Well, those people are goofy. I mean, they don't really understand scientific evidence. But yet you can fall into that trap of making wrong decisions. Now, I don't care what decisions you make when you talk to other people. For instance, there are many people who are against having the COVID vaccine when it first came out. But if you look at seniors, they all ended up getting the COVID vaccine. It was like 75, 85%, 90%. Even though some of them may have said, I don't believe in it, they then went almost like going into a porn shop. They all went to the drugstore and got their vaccine. <laughs> Speaking of porn shops, I want to tell you something <laughs> funny. And then I'll get on to work. So I was having trouble with my computer. This is about a year, oh no, two years ago. And uh, I talked to my, I have an IT guy, guy who comes out, Geek World, great guy, Geek World. If you ever need your computer at home, he's an independent contractor on Willie Street, G-E-E-K World. I do not get a penny from that. He's awesome. He will come over, fix your computer, and find out what WTF is going on. Do you know what WTF is? Anyone who doesn't, ask your neighbor next to you and they will tell you. W is what? The, and the third world, my mother would put ivory soap in my mouth if I said the word, which we did. Did any of you ever put, have your mother put soap in their mouth? Raise your hand. Can you still taste it? Yeah, mine was ivory. I have no idea what I said. I said something wrong, and then what happened was, it was the summer, and she said, and my mother was really nice. She said, what? Put me in, we were in my Aunt Lee's house across the street, brought me into the bathroom, took up, 
jar of ivory soap. We all used ivory soap. Shoved it into my mouth, said, don't you ever say it again. And then we were all going out for ice cream, and then we went out for ice cream. But I learned my lesson until I became an adult. <laughs> anyway, uh, I told him I was having trouble with my computer. And a, a Geek World guy said, go, maybe it's your monitor. And he said, get a monitor. And I thought, well, I don't want to spend money for a monitor. So he said, you can buy monitors at pawn shops. I said, really? Oh, I never knew that. So there's a pawn shop in the Beltline over there. I'd never gone in. And so I walked in the pawn shop. They've got lots of jewelry. They have a whole bunch of computers and monitors. So I got a monitor for, I don't know, 10 bucks or 20 bucks, brought it home. It was the monitor. And then I told my son, Zach, I said, I went, said, how did you do it? I went, because he saw this little monitor until the new one came in. I got it at a pawn shop. And he said to me, quote, you got it at a porn shop? <laughs> So his default to the word was porn and not pawn, which says something for society and has nothing to do with what I'm gonna talk about today. <laughs> now, um, I want you to visualize something. I think it's very important. It was an article in the New York Times uh, probably about a year or a year and a half ago, and it was your life, and it was very interesting. It was a graph. So I want you to picture a rectangle, okay? On the upper side of rectangle is the number is zero, okay? And then there are 52 boxes across, because, okay? And the second one is one, 52 boxes across. Third one, two, fourth one, three. That's your life, okay? You got a box, and it's weeks. It's 52 weeks times 100, okay? That's in this box. And when you first start out as a baby, I've got seven grandchildren, Aviva and... Uh, Aviva and Pearl are both about a year and a half. They're way at the top of this box. I've got Bella. She's in the eighth row of the box. I'm in the 76th row of the box. How far am I going to go? Very different, right? I mean, she's up here. The grandchildren up here, and they've got the whole world open up. The world is their oyster. But down here, we're not in the same place at all. And maybe we'll make it to 100. Probably not. Most people do not make it to 100. But we're down here now, and we're living, and what are we going to do? Now, often within our lives, there are decisions that we want to make. And look at it like branches of a tree. And so we have branches of the tree that go out when there are 10 or 15 or 20, and we decide an occupation. Who are we going to be with? Who are we going to live with? Are we going to have children or not have children? And we go in these various branches of a tree. And so now we're at a certain age, say 65. 70 or 75, and we think our trees, our branches are limited. Well, there are some limitations. I mean, most of you are not going to take up break dancing, although you may take up break dancing by accident, because <laughs> you may walk and do walk break dancing. But we begin to limit ourselves and believe that our options are incredibly limited, and they're not. They're not incredibly limited. They're simply limited by some of the things that we can or cannot do. So you really have branches of a tree, and if you think you're stuck on one branch, you are wrong. You are not stuck on one branch. And I'll give you a perfect example. So I work with young people. I just, uh, I mentor, I have a hobby practice. I work uh, three to four days a month at one of the dean's sites. And I do radio and TV and write a column. Um, I work uh, with Tibetan refugees. I'm uh, the physician to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I have been for 20 years. I go to India, work on a TB project. Uh, I work with a lot of young people, but I mentor medical students at the university. They're so cute. They're like in week number three, <laughs> and they have to memorize all this stuff, and it's really hard. They're all smart, but it's medical school. You've got to get all, like 10,000 words and concepts into your brain. And like I said, cute, because they could be my grandchildren, really. I mean, that's what the, you know, the age are. So they look at themselves as, you know, what are they going to be doing in their lives and all of the various options that they have. But I'm talking to you for a bit about memory, and I think this is important. When I have people my age and they forget something, they go, oh, I have a senior moment. That is an anathema and a vulgar statement that you should never, ever say. You should never say I'm having a senior moment. And the reason is <coughs> you are blaming it on your age when, in fact, people forget things all the time. When there's a teenager that forgets something, you say, oh, you weren't concentrating. You were thinking about something else. Maybe sex. Or I don't know. But you're thinking about something else. But they forgot. So my producer at the show, who's uh, in his late 30s, we do the radio show, and periodically he'll forget something. to say, oh, I forgot this. But he doesn't go, oh, I forgot this. I'm losing my memory. 
And the reason is if you forget things and you begin to blame it on your age, you will stop using your memory. And your memory is a muscle. And the less you use it, the less it's going to be there. Now, you don't have to do crossword puzzles. I hate it when they say, oh, keep your memory alive by doing crossword puzzles. I come from a family that never read. My mother or father never read. They read the newspaper. They read Life magazine. They didn't even get time. They watched TV. They never read. Nobody ever read in my entire family. And they lived, my dad lived until 87, and he did just fine. Last thing he did was sell fake antique gumball machines for dogs. 1-800-SMART-DOG, you can still buy them, the yuppie puppy. Because uh, he was, the last thing was in the gumball business with my uncle, and one day my uncle said, I bet I can get a dog to work this machine, and went down in the basement in Chicago, changed it, because dogs do not have the ability to hold change in their hand, and <laughs> made a little bone, pushed it down, 10 months later, a whole bunch came from Taiwan. My dad hit the road, sold it to Walmart, Kmart, Target, Last year, 25 years ago, they sold 25 or $4 million worth of these gumball machines. So he kept his brain active not by using, going to uh, use crossword puzzles, but by interacting with people as a salesman. So I meant that. So this interaction is critically important. So what do you do actually for longevity? And where does longevity fit? Well, longevity, um, years ago, I wrote a book called The Longevity Code, Your Personal Prescription for a Longer, Sweeter Life. Uh, it had a really good for a self-help book. We had like 50 to 75,000 copies that we sold. I did a PBS special of that name. And then I've lectured around the country here. I've lectured in Canada and Australia and a few other places. Um, and what I wrote 20 years ago, it really was 20 years ago when I wrote it, I would say 95% is still true today. Some things are not true that I couldn't say that had to do with estrogen and some of the medications, but the most part they were true that there are five spheres that influence your life. A physical sphere, a mental sphere, mind and brain, a family and social sphere, who you interact with, a spiritual sphere, what nourishes your heart and your soul. And then a material sphere. Where do you live? Do you have money in the bank? You know, do you have enough food on your table? And so on. And if you balance all of these spheres together, you will ultimately have a chance of reaching a long, sweet life. No one wants to have a long, awful life. I would never have sold any of the PBS stuff if it was a long, bad life. So what are some of the tricks? So if we look at cancer from a point of view, if we look at heredity and environment, uh, environment trumps heredity. It really does. Environment is much more important. And I'll give you an example. These are twin studies, twin studies that took place in Scandinavia, in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark. Now, in those countries, they have one insurance company. It is called the government. And you have an insurance card, and that is your lifetime card. So they know everything you take. <coughs> If you go and you get a prescription, they know whether or not you got your prescription and so on. So they have very good data, and data is excellent. And part of the study, they did a twin study. So they looked at identical twins, not fraternal twins. Remember, identical twins have the same DNA to try to figure out what part played in cancer. So if one twin had breast cancer, identical twin, there was a 25%, the other twin would get breast cancer. That means 75% is environmental or chance. If one twin had colon cancer, it was 30%. If one twin had prostate cancer, it was 40%. It meant 60% had nothing to do with the genes at all. It didn't turn on. If one twin had heart disease, which is the biggest killer prematurely for all of us, 50% chance the other twin had heart disease. So it shows you how important environment fits and what you do at any time in the branch in your life will make a difference. If you're a smoker and you quit smoking today, you get value. When do you get value? You get about a week or two, you start to breathe better. You reduce your risk of lung cancer, not for about 15 years. You reduce the risk of heart attack, which is the real thing that tobacco does. We look at at lung cancer, and you say he was a smoker, but he didn't die of lung cancer. Well, 50% of the smokers get COPD, minimal or serious. Only 20% get lung cancer. 80% don't die of lung cancer. But they lose about 10 years of life. Most of that was from premature heart attacks. And it's interesting. We have a fear in our society about cancer for a bunch of reasons. First of all, we don't like to see somebody wither away. That's a big fear. We'd rather see somebody die in their sleep. Of course, you'd rather die in your sleep. But dying suddenly 
is very different than dying gradually, where you can go to the loved person and say, I love you, and they can say, I love you to you. There really is a difference there. To me, it's not, well, I really want to die suddenly, or I'd rather die slowly. If there's no pain involved, this is a very interesting question, of which you, by the way, have no control over. But it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting question. So you have a physical sphere, mental sphere, family and social sphere, material sphere, like I said, and spiritual sphere. And so what are the things you can actually do within this to make some changes? So let's go to the physical sphere. And that's the one people really concentrate on the most. And among other things, it's the easiest thing to measure. So I want to talk a little bit about science, because I'm always discussing things uh, on columns and other things. So the FDA came out this week and said, uh, in decongestants, a pseudoephedrine works for a decongestant. And phenylephrine, which is another decongestant, doesn't do anything. Okay, doesn't do anything. Um, and it's probably going to be off the market. So we want to talk a little bit about that. So Sudafed is an interesting drug. It works well. Uh, but they limit it to behind the counter because it can be used for people who want to make methamphetamines. How many of you are at meth labs or know somebody who makes meth methamphetamines? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> but you get stuck with that also. So a lot of the drug companies move to phenylephrine. Well, it's an old drug. It's been around for, I don't know, probably 100 years, close to 100 years. And so VIX put it in, NyQuil, I think it may be in NyQuil. It's in a bunch of different things. And the Fed said, we want to do some good studies. We want to get drugs that don't do anything off the market because they're fake. In other words, if you're going to have a placebo, it shouldn't have anything in it. It should, ha should not have something in it with side effects. So they ruled this week that phenylephrine doesn't do anything. We now have good long-term studies that this drug is worthless. And so it's going to go off the market. Okay, so now at that point, you have to look and say, I've been taking this cold medicine. What have I been doing? If you're a health literate person, you'll make some decisions there on there. If you read and you listen, you go, maybe I shouldn't be taking this. That makes a difference. Health literate person, if they were taking estrogen as a woman, would get the information about that. It really was not the gift to make you sweeter and happier and longer living to reduce heart disease. It really was a drug that might cause cancer. And so 20 years ago, we stopped using it. The point is, science marches on and is always in doubt. Science never knows exactly what's going on. So if you think it says to do this, this is the right thing, and that we know this for sure, the answer is no. We never know it for sure. Never. I'm going to give you a number of important examples, because this is the point of health literacy. If you leave with one thing, I want you to leave with doubt, but that doesn't mean you can't make a decision. You just can doubt the decision. So when I started practice, um, every woman uh, at the University of Illinois in Chicago, I went to undergraduate school <clears throat> in Wisconsin. Yes, I am one of those something Illinois drivers. I can't remember. It begins with the letter F. <laughs> uh, went to University of Illinois, didn't like it, went up here, walked to the back of the union, sat down, had a beer, a real beer. I don't drink a lot of beer, but I had a beer, and I said, what am I doing? I'm home. And basically never left. My wife and I went to University of Illinois, my state school in Chicago. Then we lived in Nova Scotia for a while. We thought we'd live there, but it was, it was, too, it was, it was just too far away. Uh, and then we came back here. So when I started uh, medical school, uh, every woman, this was the idea, scientifically best way to have a baby. Women were put out with scopolamine, thorazine, and morphine to put them out of their misery when they went in to have a baby. Imagine trying to have a baby when that's in your system. Women, it was felt you have to be sterile. They were hooked up in the lithotomy position, and they were strapped to the table so they wouldn't soil the baby when the baby came out with leathers. They were taught never to have anyone in the delivery room. I was told never have the husband in in the delivery room, after all, you are touching his wife. And I thought, this is a guy named Ralph Wynn, who was head of a major person. Does he think there's sex going on here? <laughs> that is really strange. And so what happened was consumerism came in for women and said, wait a minute. Why are we doing this? Because they would do then prophylactic forceps. Women couldn't push out the baby, so they would put forceps in and push out the babies. A whole bunch of things that were going wrong. But then. Women came in, stepped up to the plate, and said, we don't want to have this. We want to have babies a different way. And now we have more modern obstetrics. Also, when I was around a medical school, we had the largest number of women ever in our class, 
6%. They're all men. And my daughter's a doctor. And now it's about 50, 50% men and women. So women who are coming into medicine, women then making health decisions, which they do more than men. Sorry, guys. Women are more likely to do that. Women doing that made a difference within that. And then they made a change. And lo and behold, they said, hey, we can have babies. We want to have the stuff there in case we need it. But we want to have it in a more natural way. So anesthesiology stepped up to the plate, developed epi uh, uh, basically epidural anesthesia. And now most women have babies without much pain or with some pain, but they don't have it the same way they had it before. That is what we have right now. Every baby was then taken out of the living room, put in a nursery. They didn't have what we now call tummy time. They weren't put on the mother right away. They felt the baby might be soiled. Maybe the mother or the father would infect them. So the baby didn't have human touch for 24 to 48 hours, which we know is very important. You know, they were in a bassinet. You remember the pictures of all those bassinets with the nurses walking back and forth. They weren't on their parent. It actually isn't a good picture. The umbilical cord was washed with physohex because it started to look crinkly and bad and the physohex would keep it up. Physohex had hexachlorophane. Hexachlorophane turns out to be a neurotoxin. So we were washing the umbilical cord to make it look good, but it turned out it could be a neurotoxin that could actually affect some of the children. We don't do that anymore. They now have crinkly umbilical cords. Put the baby on the mom, you have better obstetrics. Once again, doubt is an important part of science, but we still then begin to make decisions that are, that are good for us. So what's in the physical sphere? So let's talk about uh, diet. You know, uh, the thing that people, if you look at self-help books, the number one self-help books that ever sell are books to lose weight. You know, we're a hefty state. Wisconsin is a, a hefty state. By the way, on the happiness ranking, when they do happiness tests, we're also a happy state. I'm not recommending that heftiness is associated with happiness, but we know how to go a good time. But if you want to lose weight, you have to pay attention to that very important philosopher, Miss Piggy, who once said, never eat more than you can lift. Never eat more than you can lift. And she was a pig. She knew what she was talking about. Kermit was nice and slim, but you know, she was, she was having all this trouble. So if we look at it, it is inevitably calories in and calories out. And as we get older, they become even more important. So if you're the same way, uh, my producer, uh, Carl, who's great. So his father came up uh, from Minnesota. So his father was a track star for the 100-yard 100, 100, uh, dash in Minnesota. And he held the state record for 12 years. So he is a, must be a really fast guy. He runs, still runs. He exercises. Uh, and he looks still like a thin guy. OK, so he's probably got, I said, how close are you to your weight when you were a track star? He said, I'm about 5 or 10 pounds. Pretty good. I said, when you look in the mirror, do you look the same? He said, hell no. I don't look the same. Why? Because when we get older, we're replaced by fat. We lose one half to 1% 1 of our muscle mass every single year. No matter what we do, we lose it. And that's replaced by fat, fat in different areas. Fat usually along the buttocks, fat along the belly. So you have to look at belly fat. But no matter what we do. So, we, so to lose weight is harder because our basic metabolic weight of what we, our basic metabolic muscles that get rid of weight are not there. So in other words, you may have been able to eat at 20, 30, 40 and not gain weight, but when you do the same number of calories at 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, it's not going to work. So it's ultimately calories in, calories out, how much exercise you do and what you eat. <coughs> you want to have a diet that's good. So what does that mean? Plentiful fruits and vegetables. Uh, 40 to 60 percent of Americans do not get five servings a day. That's not much. A serving is like half a cup. It's not a lot. You don't have to eat kale. I don't like kale. I hate kale. My daughters, Dee Dee and Vanessa, are here. They love kale. They served a salad last night at our house. It had kale in it. I said, it's wonderful, darling. I love it, because they're my daughter. And I kept on thinking, That's what I kept on thinking. At least they had tomato in it. She didn't notice that I didn't eat half the kale. But I said, I love it, because, you know, family situations, <coughs> bedtime. But kale is good if you like it, but other greens are good too. Potatoes are good, but not deep fried. I know they taste good. McDonald's fries, I think they're best. I like Culver's, but I like McDonald's better. But potatoes are good, but they're starchy. So a variety of fruits and vegetables. Do not go to fruit juice. Fruit juice has a lot of calories. 
12 ounces of fruit juice basically is 12 teaspoons of sugar. Would you really take a teaspoon of sugar, which by the way is in 12 ounces of Coke or 12 ounces in a soft drink? Would you really take a teaspoon of sugar like that and keep on eating it and do it? So you don't want to get your calories through liquids. You want to get your calories through solid. When you eat fruit, you want it to have fiber. If you're eating potatoes, you want them to be mashed with, uh, with the skin on them. If you're going to use butter, you want to use a certain amount of butter that you like, but not too much butter. If you're going to use a salad dressing, you want to read the label. If you look at Paul Newman's Caesar salad dressing and Paul Newman's low-calorie Caesar salad dressing, the regular is twice the number of calories. I think it's 160 or 180. A Snickers, by the way, which to me is a measurement of calories, is 210 calories. So if you go like this for ranch, you're eating about a Snickers worth of calories. So you go, I'm eating salads all the time and I'm not losing weight. Well, it's the salad dressing they're choosing. If you go to Subway, what do you think is the most caloric sandwich in Subway? Guess. Come on, folks, you've been to Subway? No, no, tuna. People don't even say tuna, because what's in tuna? One, two, three. Mayonnaise. Right, mayonnaise. So if you're going to use something on your sandwich, don't use mayonnaise. If you are, make it a very thin amount of mayonnaise. So that's, I'm not going to get more upon diet, but those are the important things of diet. I'm going to tell you how to use age to your advantage, seriously. My dad, once he was like 67 or 70, he said, I'm a super senior. I he was younger. I, hate, I was younger. I hated that. I thought I hated that. Just didn't like it. Well, now that I'm old, I actually like it. And then my friend, our friend Rochelle lives out in California. She said, use it to your advantage. So I was having some passport problems. I had to go to Chicago, passport, and I walked up to the desk. The guy's probably like 22. And I said to him, I'm really old. Can you help me? And you know what? He smiled and said, we'll take care of you. And I want to tell you something. Do it all the time. Because in America, you never call somebody old. Even if they're 90, you go, well, you're not that old. You're only 90. But the fact is, everyone here in this room is old. You're all old. Use it to your advantage. You're getting up, you're having trouble saying, I'm old. Can you help me? Even if you can hear well and see well, and you're really not old in your brain, they'll immediately step back, and they'll say nice things, usually. I mean, they usually will. I thought I'd give you an old tip to get what you need to when you have to then, yeah, you know, stretch your age. Stretch your age. Okay, what about supplements? Most supplements are worthless. Really, most of them are worthless. We'd like to see the, think that we can get things from a pill, but we can't. One out of six seniors take fish oil. We know you should eat fish twice a week. What's the difference between fish and fish oil? Have a, to have a taste of a delicious piece of salmon and bite into a capsule of fish oil, and you will immediately see the difference. WTF. They're not the same thing at all. They're very different. There's something about fish that we know in the Mediterranean diet is important. The Mediterranean diet is the king of diets. If you want to know what it is, go and Google it. You all have computer access. Go to Google, write Mediterranean diet, and you'll see what it is. It's five to servings, roughly plentiful fruits and vegetables. When they use meat, they use small amounts of meat for taste. They don't eat large steaks. It's OK to eat large steaks every so often, small amounts of meat. They eat, uh, it's a, as I said, a variety of food You know, based on what's going on in nature. You read a book called The Blue Zones, and you read people who live for a long life functionally and feeling good. They're eating a variety of plant-based products. And they're eating fish often once or twice a week. There's something about fish that's in there. And once again, when we industrialize anything, we take things out. So in other words, we know, for instance, that broccoli has beta carotene, but we stopped putting beta carotene supplements. Uh, that was really big, if you remember, about 20 years ago, because we discovered that people taking lots of beta carotene who smoked had more lung cancer, more lung cancer versus less lung cancer. So what supplements you take? Well, first of all, I like vitamin D. Hasn't been disproven yet, it may be, but vitamin D is still up there. <laughs> and I like 2,000 units a day. I used to recommend 1,000. Now I recommend 2,000 units a day. So should it be everyone? Well, certainly in Wisconsin. If you want to get enough vitamin D in January, you've got to walk outside, strip, and lay in the sun for 30 minutes. Now, if you try that, you will die, but your vitamin D level will be perfect. So you're obviously not going to do that. So vitamin D3. So there's really good evidence for it. Cheap, inexpensive. I recommend vitamin D3. 
Multivitamins. I have gone back and forth on multivitamins based on the study that I read. So let me tell you what they don't do. They don't prevent heart attacks, they don't prevent stroke, and we have no evidence they prevent cancer. We don't have any evidence. The latest evidence and the reason why we started it is it, it's possible that it may affect memory because of some of the micronutrients that are in a standard multivitamin. So even though the data doesn't show that it produces longevity in middle-aged people, it possibly could affect your brain. And we're all worried about our brain as we get older. So I've gone back to taking a multivitamin. Which one do I buy? I buy Centrum because it's cheap, it's inexpensive, Costco brand. It just has to say 100% of the minimum daily requirements for your multivitamin. And just take it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's inexpensive. One of the reasons I've been against multivitamins is that people often say, well, I don't have to eat well because I'm taking a vitamin. And that's bogus. That's not true. It's just one of the other things that you're doing. What about vitamin C? Worthless. Linus Pauling won the Nobel Prize in Peace and won the Nobel Prize in Physics. And then he went into saying vitamin C was good. He wrote <coughs> a book called Vitamin C, something like the key to a healthy heart. Thought it worked for the common cold. It doesn't. So if you want to take vitamin C, it's an okay placebo, but it really doesn't do anything. And there's been a lot of research, ton of research on vitamin C. Beta carotene, stay away from it. Aspirin, we used to recommend aspirin for everybody. Everybody, that's science. The latest data shows it's not for everybody. Let me tell you what the data shows. If you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, if you've had a previous heart attack, previous stroke, you should be on an aspirin tablet every day. There's something called primary prevention. Primary prevention means you don't have the problem, will it prevent you from getting the problem? I would guess, I would say that primary prevention is eating a good diet and exercising. But aspirin, has not been shown to work for primary prevention. And there is a risk about one in 10,000 people get a GI bleed from aspirin. So you have to look at that and say that. So with that, I stopped taking aspirin because I looked at the latest data and I thought, I'm not gonna take it, it's science. Uh, there's another supplement that many of you take in, in, in Wisconsin and don't realize you're taking, that the American Heart Association, which is a bunch of puritanical East Coast snobs, is against, and that's alcohol. Alcohol, booze, booze. Now, there's really good data that shows that a drink a day is a salubriant. It actually improves life. And you'll see data on and off about alcohol back and forth, but the data really is very compelling. And what happens is anything that looks like it makes you happy and feels good, all those folks on the East Coast from Harvard, you know, and Duke and all those other places that can't be good for you because it feels good. But the reality is a drink a day is okay, except if you're an alcoholic. I have people who say, who ask me all the time, Dr. Pastor, I'm an alcoholic. Should I have a drink, a drink every day? No, you should not have a drink every day. But a drink every day is okay. And we don't know exactly why that is. We don't know if the alcohol. Uh, Risperidol, you remember Dr. Oz putting his politics to his side. He had some good things and some things that were goofy. I like to use the word goofy because it doesn't sound as bad as I would like to say. But he had some things, regardless of, of the politics, the goofy because he would hop on things. You'd think in the newspaper, lose, you know, lose 10 pounds in three minutes on that. But I met him a few times. He's actually a really nice guy. So he was hawking Risperidol. Uh, no, not Risperidol. That's a tranquilizer. But uh, uh, Risper Risperitol. I can't remember, but it's in the red. It's, it's within red wine. What is it? Is it is Resveratrol. Resveratrol is for psychotics. Resveratrol is what he was doing with that thing. But he was hawking that. Of course, at the time I was hawking it, he was selling it at that time. Uh, but it doesn't work. So alcohol is actually an okay thing. That's diet, okay? Let's go on to exercise. Exercise is anything you will do. Anything you will do throughout the day. Ten minutes twice a day, you're going to get something from it. You know, I used to be a member of the jogging lobby. I thought you've got to go 80% of your heart rate three times a day, 20 minutes three times a day. That's not true. You may want to do it. You may want to do Iron Man. I man the tent in Iron Man. All the people who finished, I thought, how do they do all that? Because it's not in my brain, but they do. But you may decide you want to do more because it makes you feel good. I go to a trainer twice a week because I am allergic to exercise. If I think about it, I get chills and hives. I'm not allergic to hiking, golfing every so often, skiing, going to parks and stuff like that, but somehow hitting a treadmill, I just don't do it and I should do it. 
you know, I got rid of the treadmill in the basement when my daughter looked at the room and she said, Dad, this treadmill is filled with dust. When was the last time you used it? And I said, as I'm thinking, she realizes I don't remember the last time I used it, which means it was a really long time. But anything you will do. A lot of people like group exercises. They're wonderful. They're group exercises here, I know, at the senior center. But it's very important to get your body moving. If you don't get your body moving, it doesn't work as well. So you've got to do something every single day for your life. 10 minutes twice a day. Walk around the house in the wintertime. Walk with your friends. You can go swimming if you want to at any of the pools like in Oregon. But you've got to pick things. It may not be the same thing every day, but you have to move. There's no doubt about it. Our bodies were made to move. Data has shown that people who exercise on a regular basis have less dementia. And dementia is the biggest fear that we all have. I mean, let's face it. If you get a heart attack and you die, okay. If you get a stroke and you're disabled, not okay. If you get dementia and you don't know where, where you are, and we all know people with dementia, really not okay, and memory loss. So anything to improve memory is going to be good. So it's, light, so it's you know, using your brain, of course, and exercise. <coughs> the next thing in there is sleep. Sleep is harder as you get older, as you all know. Everyone says, sleep like a baby. Well, my daughter and Didi, your daughter, Didi and Vanessa both have babies. And I said once, you know, you're not, I'd like to sleep like a baby. And she said, Dad, she wakes up every four hours. What do you mean sleep like a baby? That's really not good. I want her to sleep like I sleep. I want her to sleep for like 12 hours. So I thought, or 10 hours. I thought, I sleep like, but sleep changes. And so there's something called sleep hygiene. Look. Look it up in Google, sleep hygiene. You might get some tips of what you can do at home for sleep. Do not look at a screen, unless it's a Kindle, for 30 minutes before you go to sleep. There's something about interacting with a computer that leads to insomnia within roughly 30 minutes of sleep. Same for television. There's something about the blue light or the light from TV that does not lead to sleep. Same for alcohol. If you're taking a nightcap just before you go to sleep, it actually is not good for sleep. Over-the-counter sleeping pills on the whole are not good for sleep except for melatonin because they may make you dizzy when you're older and you may fall. And as we know, if you fall, break your pelvis over the age of 65, 50% uh, chance you will be disabled in one or more major activity of daily living, 20% chance to 25% you will be dead within two years. <clears throat> so that's where exercise also, getting back to it, plays a role and doing exercise for balance. But getting back to sleep, you want to try to do things. Melatonin is excellent. It's an okay thing to take, and for some people it makes a difference. So what else is in the physical sphere? Well, there are many things. There are drugs and other stuff. But I'm not going to labor on that. I'm going to go to the next sphere, which actually is mind and brain, which is really the most important sphere. So the mind sphere is your ability to take in information. We talked about health literacy. Lifelong learners, and you're all lifelong learners, or you'd be home watching Judge Judy. I've read about her. Do you like her? How many people, raise your hand, how many people like Judge Judy? How many people want to admit liking Judge Judy? She has more people than Oprah had at her height. It's really very interesting. I've read about her. She has like four Cadillacs and three lingers. She's a very interesting lady. Uh, I won't go into Judge Judy, that's another topic, but mind and brain. So what can you do with that? Well, we talked about that. It's lifelong learning. But it's mind, brain, and mood. What about your mood? So studies have shown that people with depression, major depression that is untreated, it's as much of a risk factor as having a cholesterol over 300 and untreated hypertension. In other words, there's something about depression and anxiety its sister that can make a difference. And so it's very important if you have depression that you treat it. Now, a third are treated well with uh, just antidepressants, third to two thirds rather, with antidepressants. Talk therapy can be very useful and a combination of them. But we treat depression and mental things very differently from that. If you come in and go into your doctor and they say, oh, you've got pneumonia, you're going to take an antibiotic. But if they say you have depression, you might say, oh, I can handle it. The problem is the older you get, you're more likely to have depression. Why? You've lost a function, other things that are going on. There are really many things that we don't quite understand. But we know that it's more common, especially in men as they get older. We know that the suicide rate, for instance, in women, uh, per capita suicide rate, uh, levels off around the age of 20 or 25. 
But we know that the suicide rate in men actually, that we know of, actually increases with age. So per capita, there are more 75-year-old men that kill themselves than 17-year-old boys that kill themselves. We know about the boys that do it because it's a catastrophe. It's awful for a 75-year-old man, but it's a catastrophe for a boy. So if you know somebody with suicide, getting them help, getting them on an antidepressant and or talk therapy is a major thing because that's the brain part. Remember, there's physical and there's mental in the brain part. What else can you do to keep your brain active? Well, the other things you can do is stay, is continue to be involved in activities that use your brain. Now, your brain uses roughly 20%, if you're sitting here <clears throat> doing nothing, 20% of all the energy that your body is expanding right now goes to your brain. So the brain is an energy suck, 20%. And the brain has no reserves. So if you have a stroke and use blood supply to your brain, the, all the nerves in the brain die within three minutes. There's no energy supply. It only gets energy from other, from other places. So it's very important within your brain to keep it active by doing things. And that's kind of where the social sphere begins to come in. You know, uh, any of you remember COVID? Remember COVID? <laughs> Remember when we were home, we didn't know how it was spread, we didn't know if it was through doorknobs, science didn't know either, we thought it was spread by touching. We now know it's spread by, by close contact. <clears throat> and most of you are immunized. And I highly recommend you all get the new booster when it comes out. Why? Because I'm getting the new booster. I'm getting all three. I'm getting the RSV, boost, RSV shot, you should get it. RSV kills uh, 500 kids a year. Uh, it, responsible for 20 or 30,000 hospitalizations, but it kills 15,000 adults every year. It's a big killer. And my wife had it, I'm sure she had it. What happened was we were in Seattle visiting my daughter, Dee Dee, and she has three kids. That time she had two kids. And Lorenzo was one of these snot machines. He's just always sick, you know, any one of these little kids just snots, always coming out. And he was wheezing, uh, and he was sick, he was on an inhaler. And then my wife wasn't feeling good in retrospect, and she fell, we were in National Park, fell, fractured her shoulder, which really caused her pain for maybe nine or 10 months. And Lorenzo, once he got tested back in Seattle, had RSV. I'm sure she had RSV too. We didn't test her. The RSV vaccine is about 85% effective. Doesn't hurt as much as the shingles vaccine. All of you have had chicken pox. All of you should get the shingles vaccine, by the way. It's wonderful, it's great, reduces the risk of shingles. The new GSK vaccine reduces the risk by 95%. The old Merck vaccine is only about 60% effective. So you should all get the shingles, two-part vaccine covered by Medicare Part D. Yes, your arm does hurt, and yes, you might not feel good for 24 hours, WTF. You don't get shingles. So you have the RSV vaccine, you can get all three at the same time, by the way, not shingles. RSV, influenza, and COVID. And I recommend doing all three. And the reason is, once you start the antibody response, it improves the antibody response for all three. In other words, getting them all at the same time, even though you might feel a little bit ill, most do not, actually is a better way to, re to get those antibodies to get there and stay up. So within the social sphere, that's the third sphere, it's very important to have friends and family. We saw this during COVID. But there's also some very good data. There's very good data about people who live alone do not live as long a life. Hermits, now why is that? Well, there's one effect that I call the nagging effect. Honey, you should see someone about this. I don't think you're doing everything right. It's a real effect. And some of you are smiling. Most of them are women looking at men. <laughs> I just want to tell you something. <laughs> you know, honey, you're all smiling thinking about that effect. Some of them are now men smiling because the women have looked at them and, you know, it's kind of... In. But within the social sphere, having friends and family turns out to probably be I used to think of it as a second, as like a number two booster, number three booster. I now think it's the number one booster. I think friends and family actually do much more for us than I ever thought before. I mean, imagine during COVID when people were dying and you, they were in the nursing home and you couldn't hug them. What did that mean to that person as they're dying? And what did it mean to the people who wanted to hug that person? I mean, did we ever really understand until this came in how awful it was? Now, my wife, uh, Penny, uh, she's got some medical problems. She's in hospice, and I can talk about it. She lets, always lets me talk about her. 
And she was really sick like two days ago, three days ago. I have four kids, one lives in town, one lives in Boston, uh, two live in Seattle. And the two in Seattle dropped everything, dropped everything, and came to see her, and came to see me. So my daughter Dee Dee, it's really interesting, Nick, uh, Vanessa has two kids, and Mitchell uh, is a, a doc, but he's gonna be starting a new job. He said, just go, I'll take care of it. Dee Dee's husband works in Bethel, Alaska, he had to go to, he was gonna have to go the next day to Bethel, called his mother who lives in Connecticut. She flew, almost missed the connecting flight, arrived in Seattle, Didi took the morning flight, Angela arrived at one o'clock in the afternoon, and then started picking the kids up from preschool. And she'd never, she was, a, uh, she was the oldest of seven kids in her family, and she was an elementary school principal for 30 years, so she knew how to, middle school, so she knew how to handle kids. And everyone got together. That's the social sphere. How did that make Penny feel? How did it make my wife feel? How did it make me feel? How did it make my kids feel? How does that affect our longevity? Of course it affects our longevity. Now, does it affect my wife Penny's longevity? Probably. Does it affect her quality of life? Of course. The social sphere is the sphere that we often neglect to look at. We may have arguments with our relatives that we might, can't make up for, but can bring it to neutral. We might be able to do that. My wife had two sisters, one of whom passed away, one who was more difficult, she was just more difficult, and she would periodically fight, and then they would try to make up and it would be okay. So that's part of your social sphere. You must nourish that. Don't take it as a secondary issue. The other problem is that we, as we get older, we start to lose our friends, because they die. The trees are falling in the woods, so our social sphere begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So often, we don't have anyone else. Uh, my friend, I've got a very good friend, Stuart Prager, a physicist, UW, then was head of uh, a lab, went to Princeton, head of a lab, and he was telling me about his mother. So his mother, just since passed away, his dad was very much antisocial, and they had a very small group of friends. And when the dad died, and the mother lived another 20 years, and they had moved out of uh, <clears throat> New Jersey, around Princeton, he was, a, she was, he was a professor, I think. Uh, and then they moved to like Northern Connecticut. And so she was alone and she started joining book groups. He didn't really know this because this is when they were raising kids. And she had like two or three group of uh, book groups. And when she died, there were a bunch of people that showed up to the funeral who he had never met, who were 20 and 30 years younger than she was. So intergenerational, intergenerational social skills are very important. You know, if you're surrounded by old people, often at the beginning of dinner, you have what I call an organ recital. <laughs> How are the organs doing? Oh, I got this back over here. I was vomiting. I've got this headache over here. Got, you know, when we have our friends over at the house, we say, it's okay, organ recital, first 10 minutes, then we don't discuss organs. We discuss something else. Younger people don't discuss organs. Well, they may discuss one organ if they're pretty young, and I'll let you figure out which organ they're actually discussing. But getting back to that, I want to talk about the Ohio study. Uh, and uh, many of you have heard of the Framingham Heart Study. That's a study that is very important. Framingham, Massachusetts, they've been following uh, cohorts, groups of people for 10 years, or rather it started, uh, and then every 20 years they have a new group of people to see what produces longevity and what does not. So in Oxford, Ohio, Miami University, they wanted to try the same kind of study, uh, and then after like 10, 20 years they lost their funding. And, uh, oh, and Oxford was sort of like Madison was years ago, it's a small sort of town. <clears throat> so uh, about uh, 25 years later, a woman went through who was a psychologist, because they answered a bunch of questionnaires, how do you feel, and she wanted to see whether or not there was a mental factor that would that show who lived and who died. So what she did was she was able to reconstruct <coughs> 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 about somewhere in 85 to 90 percent of the people who were on the study and then their national death records so she could find out 25 years later who was alive and who wasn't because it's all recorded. Even though you all don't have the same insurance company, the federal government knows who lives and who dies because you owe taxes. So they keep 100% track. They may not care if you <laughs> have insurance, but they care if you die because you owe them money. It's very funny, but it's true. <laughs> 
So in the Ohio study, they found that people who were optimistic lived roughly 7.5 years longer than people who are not. So I'm going to give you the four questions that they asked that showed them. This is, this is people were asked questions. It was a yes or no answer, and it was really a basis. So question number one, things keep getting worse as I get older. Obviously, it's pessimism. As you get older, you are less useful. Pessimism. I am as happy now as I was as I, when I was younger. Obviously, optimism. As I get older, things are better than I thought they would be. Very, very interesting. So the optimism is an extremely important thing that was often within the mind and brain sphere, but really is within the social sphere, I think. Now, I won't go into detail. I do it some, but but I won't at this time. But when I was carjacked in Venezuela at gunpoint 10 years ago, and there was a gun at my head, and I successfully got out of that situation, I didn't think about the multivitamin I was taking or whether I could jog three times a day on the treadmill. I thought about my family, and I said, I have to get out of that situation for my family. And I took the correct action which I'll go over when we're done for anyone who wants to listen to it. But it was the social sphere that saved my life. That's exactly what it was. But it was the optimism sphere, because often if you have kids, they fill you with optimism. I mean, we now have, we just put a playground in our backyard. We've lived in Fitchburg for 45 years, uh, and we used to have a playground when our kids were younger, and our, our children, who have grandchildren, said, why don't we have a playground in the back? I said, I don't know. So Zach said, you're going to pay for it. I'm buying it at Home Depot. I'll make sure it gets put up. And now I look at this playground, and it makes me smile, because I know the playground now is going to have children in it, and there's something about children squeaking and yelling on a playground that makes me feel good. I don't know why. I do know why. It's social and it's evolutionary, but it's really very important and it increases my optimism. So that's really, that's really very important. So let's talk about the spiritual sphere. What's in the spiritual sphere? You know, it's really spiritual, what nourishes your heart and your soul. And for many people, it's religion. It's very, very uh, interesting. So uh, I have a neighbor next door who is an evangelical Christian, very important to him. Bible studies and others. And his wife died, uh, his, he has a new wife, but his wife died probably about 20 years ago. And for him, he knew where she was going. And that was very important to him. And it really helped him go through his grieving process because that, that was important to him. I have other friends who are complete secularists and there, there's no where they're going. We don't know where they're going. They're not going. And they have a different pattern of that within religion. But it's that religion or non-religion that nourishes your heart and soul that makes a difference. So what else nourishes your heart? It can be philosophy. It can be music. When I go to the symphony, I love the symphony. What does that nourish? It nourishes my heart. It can be art. It can be music. It can be your dog. Animals and pets are a very important part, I think, of a spiritual issue. When our dog Izzy died, I got twice as many cards, condolent cards, than when my dad died. Now, my dad really meant more to me than my dog. But the dog lovers obviously connected more with me. They didn't know my dad, but they saw my dog, you know, at the dog part. So it's whatever nourishes your heart and your soul. Now, I mentioned I take care of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I've known him for many years. In 1981, when he came and spoke at the university in a deer park out here, he stayed at our house for two weeks. It's a very unusual thing. It's not as if we stayed there. We had three kids at that time, four, three, and two. Vanessa had not been born. And we moved out, helped with the house, helped with him, saw the entourage. And then when he comes to the US to have an executive physical at Mayo Clinic, I'm in charge. So I've been around him all the time. For a long time. And so uh, I've learned a little bit. I haven't learned a lot because I'm dumb, but I've learned a little bit. And what I've learned is he always says compassion is the most important thing that we have. And often it's things that we don't think about. That even if you are the most selfish person in the world, you're really selfish, you'll know a wise selfish person knows that helping somebody else can help yourself. And it really does make a difference. So my wife Penny has mobility issues. 
and she has some memory issues too. And so she was going to a bridal shower. This is like a year ago. I wrote about this in the newspaper, a year and a half ago. And so I dropped her off uh, at uh, an apartment building near Shanks Corners on the east side. Dropped her off. Uh, and then she had her phone with her. And you can't get in the building because you know it's outside the building. You have to have a buzz code. But they had a, on the door, they had a little sign that said, when you want to come in, text this number and we'll come and let you out because it was in the party room on the first floor. No problem. Dropped her off. I don't want to go to a bridal shower. Last thing in the world any guy wants to do. Bridal showers, they're for women. They're not for men. If you have to go, smile. It's important. But if you don't have to go, <laughs> go somewhere else. So I went somewhere else. I don't know what I did, but I went somewhere else. But I have to, uh, to pick her up. So she, you know, at 5.30. So I went there at 5.30. And the sign is down. I hit a text. So I have to stand out there and wait for somebody to come down because I'm knocking on the door. And her phone is dead. And she's in there. You know, there is, I know the brighter shower is over, and I'm in a quadri, but eventually someone will come down. So this 20-something comes down with uh, two or three pizza boxes off to the side to throw them away and said, pardon me, my wife is in the party room. Can you open the door and take me there? And he said, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. We're not allowed to let anyone in the building. I said, okay, well, could you go in the party room and tell them Zorb is here to pick up his wife? It's right down there. Literally, we're talking about like at the end of this. It's not like on the 15th floor of the Morrison Hotel in Chicago. Fucking A. It's right down the floor. Sorry, Mom. I just know I said the word fuck, but sometimes it's appropriate. And besides, you know that word anyway. And if you're insulted, I'm sorry. Not really, but... <clears throat> but I didn't say that to him because I'm not that kind of person. I said, really? Sorry. And then he went. He left. He did not help me. I was really shocked by this. I was totally shocked. I was also disappointed that this person didn't help me. It was a minimal help. Uh, eventually, what happened was, in the room, they realized I had not come there, and they probably came out to look. So somebody from the party came out and said, oh, you're here, Zorba. And then I went in, got my wife, took care of it. And I thought, I have to write about this. You know, this is really very disturbing. Where does humanity come? So the next day, or two days later, we went, we like going to Overture Center, we get out late, and then we go to La Hacienda, which is this, the Mexican restaurant in Park Street. If you like Mexican food, it's great. They're open until 3 o'clock in the morning. You can bring grandchildren in there because it's always noisy because people come with their families. It's really good, what you would call authentic Mexican food. So we get out of the car, and Penny... Uh, we've got a disability ban, and Penny's uh, in the wheelchair. And so I'm walking towards the door, and a young couple is coming out. You know, they don't see us. I mean, you know, they're, we're over here, and they don't see it. And they're, they're walking out, and then the guy looks at me and turns around and goes and opens the door for me. And I went through, I said, thank you. And he said, no problem. And I thought to myself, that's where 95% of the people are. 95% of the people are going to open the door for me. 5% are not. But we all have situations within our lives when we don't give the, sh we give the short shrift and we really should not do that. I'm going to give another example before I go any further. Walgreens. Somebody sits there and says, you know, I'm buying something. Do you want to give $5 to the American Cancer Society? I used to hate that. I just would hate it. Now, we give money away to charity. We really do. But I don't want somebody asking me to give $5. Why don't I like it? I don't know why. But I, what should I do? And this is in Oregon, so I knew the person asking me. And I said nicely. I got, the New York, I got whatever I was getting. And I said no. I didn't say no. I said no. And then I got in my car, and I thought, this is awful. What am I doing? There's probably some situation like... I know Walgreens is going to give the money to the American Cancer Society. I'm not worried there's corruption. I really am not. And there probably is a little gaming aspect, like how much did you make on your shift, or how much did uh, the district make, or how much did Walgreens make, or something. There's probably a little bit in there that you talk about that they're proud of. And I can't give a dollar? Where's my brain at? It's a dollar. I mean, when I grew up, a dime was worth what a dollar is worth today. You know, that's what it was. And I said, I have to solve the problem. And then I figured it out. Walking the dog in the dog park, it all of a sudden came to me. I can solve this problem and make my brain different in a more compassionate way. So the next day I went uh, to Walgreens, same Walgreens, same woman there, uh, to get a New York Times. And she said, do you want to donate to the Cancer Society? And I said, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. I have no idea if she heard me or not. 
I said, thank you for the opportunity. No, she did hear me. She said, thank you, actually, now that I think about it. And then I gave $5. And now I do that every single time. I say, thank you for the opportunity. If they look at me, if they don't look at me and it's just in there, I may not do it. But I say, thank you for the opportunity because I'm connecting with that person in the social sphere. I'm doing something for them. They feel good. I feel good. It's a buck. Come on. It's a buck. A buck doesn't mean that much. We're not talking about $50. So that's your chance within the religious sphere to do something. You know, if you just look at a Bible and you just read a passage, or you do something, but you don't act it out, you know how worthless that is with anything. So that's the spiritual sphere. So the last part is the material sphere. You have physical, mental, family, and social, spiritual, material. I'm going to finish up, and then I'm going to tell you about the workshop next week, if you're interested. So what's in the material? In the material sphere is where we live and what we have and everything within our physical environment. So it's making your house beautiful. It's getting rid of throw rugs so you don't fall and hurt yourself and fracture your leg. It's changing all the lights to LED lights because they're cheaper and you'll have less money on your utility bill. Spend the money, get a good LED light, don't buy, a, you know, buy a name brand from, <coughs> you know, from Home Depot or something else, but get a good light and they do last for a long time. And you cut down your energy bill quite a lot from that. Make sure they're bright enough. Make sure you have night lights all around in the house. Make sure the outside is bright. If you have trouble walking in the wintertime, go get, uh, they're called yak traps, put them on the bottom of your feet so you don't slip and fall. If you have trouble shoveling snow, hire someone or ask someone because you don't want to fall and break your hip. Too many men do it. If you look at typical shoveling snow, if you shovel this quickly, that's roughly one ton of snow in 20 minutes. You're moving a ton. If I told you to lift a ton of bricks in 20 minutes and move it from this pile to that pile, you wouldn't do it. But with snow, and this is a male issue, got to get it off there right now. You never know. We got to make sure we get out of the house in case we have 911. Believe me, if you call 911, those young guys will come and get you to the hospital. You don't really have to worry. But you have to look visually at what's going on within your life. It's also brokering the money you have in your account so you have enough money for food. That's very important. Inflation is a huge bite, and it's a huge bite on the food that we eat. If you go to McDonald's now and get a Big Mac and fries, and 5% of the population, something like 3 to 5% eats at McDonald's once a week, an amazing amount when I look up the numbers. A Big Mac, fries, and a Coke, $9.50. $9.50, that is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So when you're looking at going out to eat, if you're looking to save money, you really don't know how to cook, you can't cook, you can't make things in the future, that may save you money and you'll eat better. My partner has two young kids. I like to, to, I don't, I like to spend money on food, but I don't like to spend money on the experience of shopping. <clears throat> That's a different thing. So I go to Woodman's. You can never beat the price of Woodman's. I go to Aldi's. I went to Aldi's the other day because I like their vegetables. I think their vegetables are really good. Uh, one brother, uh, Aldi's is owned by a family. One brother owns Trader Joe's and the other brother owns Aldi's. German family. It's very interesting. Their, their fruits and vegetables are good. <clears throat> I'm standing in line. A woman turns around and looks at me and goes, you're Dr. Pastor and you're shopping at Aldi's? <laughs> It was so funny. It was like, no, I should shop like with my butler, you know, at High V and spend twice as much. It was a very strange thing that she said, but it really wasn't really wasn't strange at all. It was very important. Carbon monoxide detectors, do you have them? If you don't have them, obviously. Get them. Twenty five bucks. Plug them in the wall, you're fine. There'll be about five to ten people here well, in the uh, in Wisconsin. There'll be about thirty to fifty people who'd be hospitalized for carbon monoxide poisoning. So get it. You don't have it, put one on each floor, you're done. Uh, smoke detectors, if you have old ones like I have in the house, by the new ones that have lithium batteries, they last for five years. Who can change those every six months? And besides, you have to get up on a ladder, and you should not be getting up on the ladder. So make sure your smoke detectors are really working. So that's within your material sphere. Now, if you put all of these things together, physical, mental, family, and social, spiritual, and material, what you have to do also is you have to look at how you can be successful. And if we look at success, and we look at Ralph Waldo Emerson, you all learned about him in elementary or high school, he had a definition of success, which was to laugh often, okay? To win the affection of children, they would win the affection of children, and, <clears throat> and 
the, uh, the attention of honest and intelligent people, to earn the respect of honest critics, and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to live, to leave the world a better place, be it by a healthy child, a garden plot, or a redeemed social condition. If one person has lived longer on this world because of you, that, my friend, is the definition of success. So if you look at success and what you want to have, once again, like I said at the very beginning, you have these branches, you have new branches. There are things that you can do and you should do right now and take action. There are a number of things that allow you to do this. And you also have to look for longevity mentors. But the things you want are, number one, lifelong learning. Obviously, we've talked about that. Active involvement in life. You're doing by coming out here. Uh, there's, uh, there was a study that came out a few years ago that looked at people who were actively involved in life. They went to movies. They went to shows. <clears throat> they volunteered in places. They didn't just sit and watch TV. Okay. <clears throat> They also included active involvement in life, not just active things, but Indian casinos, actively involved in a non-athletic way. <clears throat> and what they found that people who are just couch potatoes, on the whole, lost about two to three years and were more likely to be disabled than people who are actively involved in life. Okay? So it's lifelong learning, actively involved in life, and the third is hopefulness. And hopefulness is not the same as everything is going to turn out right. And I've really been interested in this concept of hopefulness. And I've looked at a variety of definitions of what they are. But hopefulness is the feeling that there's something good in front of you and the desire to get to that space. So think about that. It's not intellectual. Hopefulness is feeling and desire. Feeling that there's a good place to be and the desire to get to that spot. So anything that nourishes hopefulness can really make a difference. So years ago, when I was uh, going to medical school at the University of Illinois, here it is, it's the 1970s. Uh, you know, I was a poor medical student. Medical school was expensive, not as expensive as it was today, living with five people uh, in a house in Chicago. Uh, it was November. <clears throat> Didn't have enough money, having trouble paying my rent. I, I, I couldn't go to medical school and work. I had to take off loans. I just couldn't, couldn't do that. I'd saved money my whole life, but I couldn't work and go to medical school. I had trouble getting food. You know, I was eating, you know, mostly humane. And I didn't have a girlfriend. And I was really depressed. You know, it's November. So there was a break. And so I took the Greyhound bus uh, to California, San Francisco. How many of you have ridden the Greyhound bus across the country? You remember what it was like. You know, by the way, it was $25 round trip anywhere in the country, $50 unlimited. Now, in those days in the Greyhound bus, you could smoke, you could drink, not officially. You had a brown bag there. And at 2.30 in the afternoon, in the morning, they would open up the bus and clean out the bus for you. I have no idea why I did it at 2.30. And then they would open up the Post House Cafe, which had the worst food in the world. It was pre-chewed food. It was disgusting. The drivers always went next door to the bar to get a burger. So I went to the Zen Center in San Francisco and sat Zazen for a week. That's why I'm really interested in Buddhism and Zazen, which we now really call mindfulness, your ability to just calm your thoughts and see what it was. Because I was debating whether to drop out of medical school at that point. I was very unhappy, dis, uh, was very disenchanted with medicine and many of the things. Medical school at Wisconsin was very different than medical school at the U of I, very different thing. So when they call you to meditate in the morning, it's 5.30 in the morning, I'm a nighttime person. That's usually when I go to sleep. They would clap and make a sound. And on there, on the drum, was a Zen poem, Attention. Great is the problem of life and death. Time passes quickly by, and opportunity is lost. Each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken. Take heed. Do not squander your life. Do not squander your life. You have a golden moment. You are still alive. You can experience awe and joy and happiness and do good things for others and nourish yourself and nourish others. You have that opportunity. Your branches, they're not unlimited, but they're not limited as much as you think. And if you take advantage of doing our five, the five spheres, you can achieve more than you ever have 
thought you could achieve if you have hope. And if you come back, you can take pieces over there next week. I'm going to give you some tips and clues on how to find your own individual longevity plan. Take that with you. Bring it back next week. Same time, same station. And thank you very much. Thanks. And, and next week, if you're here, I'll tell you how I survived carjacking in Venezuela. Yeah.